Bruh, bruh, bruh. <sighs> Hey guys, welcome back to another part in my vinyl collection series. This is part three we're on right now. And uh, yeah, this past week I haven't uploaded anything, which kind of sucks, because I try to do a video at least uh, twice a week, one on the weekends, one on the weekdays. And it was quite the roadblock for me because the computer, which I've had for the past, like, oh God, 12 years. Yeah, wow, it's really been that long. Uh, finally shit the bed on me, so I had to get a new computer, because, you know, hashtag capitalism, and, uh, yeah, now that I finally got a new computer, we can get back, for me at least, on a regular schedule of doing some uploads, you know, twice a week, and, uh, yeah, other than that, really, I don't know if you guys are going to hear if the microphone and the camera is picking it up, but, uh, there is, like, some background music at my own place, because I live over a bar, and this bar right now is blasting really loud music. So hopefully, again, it's not picking up anything on the microphone. But to cancel that out and to replace it with something much better, uh, what's going to be playing in the background is Feral Light. Um, <clears throat> massive thanks to my friend Richard for recommending me this, because this is really, really good atmospheric black metal. And not like the typical cliche, you know, atmospheric black metal of like, you know, pretty boy stuff and wannabe pagans that want to fuck basically every tree branch they look at. Uh, this is like the type of atmospheric black metal that just has really good grade A musicianship that reminds me a lot of Yuvia and Early Over to some degree. And the guitar work on here is absolutely sensational with the solos. Just overall really good like semi-raw ritualistic uh, atmospheric black metal that I urge you to check out, which it will be in a link provided below under uh, background music. And the link will go to their band cam, which they still have a few copies of the LP variant, which I urge you to get while it's still available. Finally, with all that being said, now we can finally get into this vinyl collection part at hand. Last part, I had to go through everything I owned of a kit, so, so now we can finally start with a different band. That being the small collection I have of Alcest, this is their sophomore album, Acalis de Lune. Come on, you guys. You should all know this. Alcest is a very recognizable band that really kind of paved the way for what Black Gaze, you know, the combination between shoegaze and black metal would sound like. And to me, this is just such a surreal, blissful album that is just absolutely gorgeous from beginning to end that's a fan favorite for good reason. That from what I remember, the themes about this uh, early records anyway by Alcest is it all has to do with uh, Nisha's childhood uh, dreams that he had which is quite interesting that I feel like really complements the surreal tone they're trying to create that's just absolutely gorgeous and I've noticed Alcest really attracts a lot of fans that aren't typically black metal fans and because of that all the purists seem to hate Alcest for that which I find fucking childish as fuck like, grow the fuck up, change your shitty underwear, and get over the fact that Alcest makes great music, regardless if they're a true black metal band or not. Anyway, as for the layout, this is a first press prophecy record. Got artwork, backside of the track listings, comes on a gatefold. And as I stated, this is the first press on semi-translucent blue vinyl. The only other thing I have by Alcest is their fourth album, Shelter. And a lot of Alcest fans would say this is their worst album because, oh, all the black metal stuff is completely gone. Why isn't Niche screaming? This album's so boring. They become pop. What the hell is going on? Shut the fuck up and nut the fuck up. This album is great. Just because they've completely abandoned their black metal, you know, usage, for one record doesn't change the fact that the grade A writing by Niche and company with Alsace is still present on this album. And why should it surprise anyone that they went like full shoegaze pop? Because even their black metal albums as we kind of claim that they are, there's still a humongous usage of shoegaze to the fact that like black metal is the least used genre with their previous material. So really looking in their timeline within their discography, this should, really shouldn't come as a surprise, and personally I think this is a great Alcest uh, record, but uh, really the only reason why I got this was because it was pretty cheap at Armageddon back when I used to go there, and I figured, 
why the fuck not get this for a really cheap price without paying ridiculous uh, shipping because Prophecy Records, as great as they are, they're from out of uh, the country, I believe, so the shipping isn't always the kindest for uh, people who live in my country. But yeah, they went full shoegaze pop, and really, I think it sounds just as good as anything else. Once again, just keeping the routine going. Got the artwork. Backside comes on a gatefold with all the lyrics. As well, we got a printed inner sleeve, side one and two. And this vinyl variant comes on clear vinyl. Next up is Alda with their latest album they've done is Yet Passage. Alda is a Cascadian black metal band that I use that loosely because it's more like folk metal with like black metal tendency and usage throughout uh, each album that I remember when I got this a few years ago I thought this was really good but listening to it now more and more really the only thing about this I really like is like the acoustic folk like interludes within this album because the black metal usage really isn't anything special like I know a lot of people like to appraise Cascadian black metal as it's super pretty and gorgeous but I don't know, they all just blend into each other so much that I just feel like I'm continuously listening to like a Wolves in the Throne Room ripoff that it gets sickening kind of quickly. So really to me now, you know, having this for a couple of years, the acoustic parts are really where it's at with this album. As to where you can get this album, it was put out through Byron Room Recordings and last time I checked they're down to like their last couple of copies still available on the web store, so get them while you can through Byron Room. And uh, keeping the tradition going, I'll show you the layout of everything. And I'll just state this once throughout the series. The reason why I do this, you know, showing the album artwork, the backside, the gate folds, the printed inner sleeves, all that jazz, is because I look at it as someone took the time to put this all together, lay out everything, take photographs of the band, and set all this up. And, you know, someone really put in the work to do that. And I can't help but admire that, which is why I, you know, take the time to showcase you guys everything and I think it's important to do that so just wanted to ramble on and state that because just in case you think I do this for no reason at all that's the main reason why but anyway getting back on track you have the artwork right here backside with the track listings comes on a gatefold really think that artwork looks really cool with a big ass booklet that goes along with lyrics and artwork double LP both on red vinyl Three sides and side D is just all dead wax. From there we go to Altar of Plagues with their swan songs of an album, Teeth, Glory, and Injury. Let me start off by saying massive thanks to my friend Jacob for selling me this for a reasonable price because on Discogs and eBay this goes for dumb money right now. So massive thanks to you dude. But uh, yeah, Altar of Plagues was a post-black metal band from Ireland, which is quite the shocker, because there really isn't that much metal of any kind coming from Ireland, so this is quite the shocker. And these guys blended post-black metal in a very dark, dismal way, whereas most post-black metal bands really sound more like an aggressive post-rock band, these guys still kept the genre raw. But as to where it still had some unique moments and experimental moments to give it like that post black metal tag with it that really this album definitely deserves all the appraise it gets i mean from the choirs and the musicianship even the kind of like dark ambient moments during some of the interlude tracks it really makes for a very unique experience when listening to the style of post black metal if you really want to get that technical with the subgenres. Tracks on here that I think are really worthy of checking out are God Alone, A Body Shrouded, and Reflection Pulse Remain are some of the standard tracks in this album that should definitely win you over on it. This is a back on black pressing sadly, but surprisingly this actually sounds really good. And as we get through this video, there's gonna be other records I'm gonna show that are back on black that aren't good at all, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, yeah, keeping the kind of like schedule going with everything. Have artwork right here. Backside comes on a gatefold. Double LP and this variant is on gray vinyl. Moving on next to a finished death metal classic that honestly everyone watching this should already know. 
And that would be Amorphous with their legendary sophomore album, Tales from a Thousand Lakes. God damn, let me tell you guys, seeing Amorphous close out the Maryland Death Fest playing this album in its entirety is just absolutely breathtaking, which I really don't like using that word really when talking about metal of any kind, but it was just too perfect and so bittersweet of an ending for the Maryland Death Fest when I caught them at the 2015 year because man this album is absolutely gorgeous yet still aggressive and has just enough kick to it that you know die-hard metal purists can definitely find a lot of enjoyment with it. I would say it blends like death metal to a certain degree, doom metal and progressive metal as well and none of it feels pretentious, none of it feels like it drags out or sides too much on one side. It's very evenly blended out, and I feel like all the appraise it ever gets, all the attention it will ever receive, all the people wearing the shirts and collecting all the different vinyl variants of it, it's all justified because really this is some grade A you know, example of what basically finished metal has within its scene. and. God damn, this album is just too good not to own regardless of what you know genre of music is your preferred taste within metal. Tracks on here that I really enjoy a lot are The Castaway, Black Winter Day, uh, In the Beginning, and To Father's Cabin. Just uh, so good that I can listen to this album front to back and then on repeat over and over again. Funny enough, this is considered one of the rare variants of this record, and I got it at a Newberry Comics when I really started just collecting vinyl. Like I think like the first couple of months I was really getting into this format is when I found this. And this is the limited uh, Finland edition variant of it, that both LPs come on a different color, which I'll show in a little bit. But uh, yeah, as for the layout for it, you have the very recognizable artwork. Backside with track listings, this is the relapse repress of it. Comes on a gatefold with lyrics inside. As I stated, double LP comes on two different variants of the Finnish flag. Side A and B is on white, and side C and D comes on like a bluish marble color. Let me tell you guys, doing this vinyl collection series all over again, each time I get into a new part, I'll look through all the 15 records I pull out, and if I haven't listened to any in a while, I'll replay them to refresh my mind. That way when I talk about it, I can go in a bit better detail with each one. And by doing that, I've rediscovered how awesome this band is that I totally forgot about in my collection. And that would be AMSG with their debut full-length, Anti-Cosmic Tyranny. These guys are a Canadian-based black metal band that plays a very riff-heavy, raw style of black metal that really the standout thing about them that a lot of people will appraise is during some of these tracks, I think it's the track Reincarnation of the Sun and the outro of the track Bone Blood and Black Thorn, that there is a saxophone used with this, which is just such an odd thing to use for a raw black metal band because Really, can you name any black metal bands out there that play in the very raw style of black metal that use a saxophone that isn't like Necromantia? Really isn't that many out there to name. And what's really interesting too is that the saxophone player in this album, I believe he is the sole member of the band Bro Vinyl 2, which I can't wait to talk about soon within this uh series of mine because Bravado 2 is honestly some of the most underrated black metal that I can think of. And the guy responsible uh, for that band takes a part in this album and really makes uh, AMSG, which is a very basic style of black metal, you know, not the new it being raw and riff heavy, give out some like, you know, memorable outstanding moments that usually bands like this don't do. I will say though, the first half of this album is decent, I would say it's pretty good, but the second half of this album, oh my god, it's like they turned it to a whole new level, the riffs are better, the vocals sound way harsher, just everything for some reason on side B, the second half of this album is just beefed up and it's easily the best material they ever wrote. So if you want to check this out, I urge you to listen to the second half of this album because it's just absolutely 
killer. As for the layout, I just want to state something that I find really fucking dumb. So you have this artwork right here that's not the actual original artwork. This is just like the slip case for the LP that contains the original artwork, which I'll show in a sec. But yeah, this variant right here with this artwork and the recent cassette variant that again has this artwork as well are both blacklisted, yet the CD variant that has the original artwork isn't. So now has it come to the point with Discogs if the artwork looks bad and sketchy then it's automatically blacklisted, not like it's actual content? Like, shit makes me roll my fucking eyes, but whatever. I mean, I'm just complaining about really pointless stuff. Uh, this was put out through Graceless Recordings, this LP variant, which sucks because Graceless Recordings hasn't done anything in years, and they were a great uh, distro from, uh, I believe, North Carolina? I know it's from the States, and it always sucks when distros <clears throat> from, you know, the States, where I'm from, close down because it's another place that I can't save, like, I don't know, almost $20 on shipping because Anything else outside this country just goes for insanely stupid money when it comes to shipping and handling. But anyway, with the layout, we have this uh, slipcase with the front and back of it. And as I stated, it is a slipcase. So you slide this out and you get the original artwork for the album. Then you have the backside for that. Comes with a big ass booklet of the artwork and just imagery to go along with everything and I love just how over the top and ridiculous like uh, one of the main members uh, stage names are yeah it's Angel Fuck Witch Hammer <laughs> really as for the vinyl variant it comes on this red and black splatter it looks absolutely gorgeous then I also have the sophomore album by AMSG Hostess University Generous once again, just like the previous AMSG album, I totally forgot how good this album is as well. Now, I will state there's a little bit of a difference between this and the debut. The debut, I would say in terms of experimentation and songwriting, I think is a bit more creative. Whereas this album has, like, I think one song, and I think it's Baptized in the Blood of Galleries, the outro, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's actually uh, Broken Chains of Cursed Flesh, the intro of that has the saxophone used. I believe it's only like once they use it, whereas the previous album it's used a bit more that, you know, in terms of creativity and songwriting, that's toned down a bit, but the riffs are just beefed up way more. Like, just the track alone, uh, The Exodus of All Life, easily the best riffs you'll hear from AMSG, and it's absolutely killer so they sacrificed one thing and beefed up another thing how i look at this album but still stellar stuff by amsg once again as for the artwork you have this awesome painting done by the one and only jeff whitehead which i mean you can tell it's him just from his signature style backside with track listings put out through profound lore records comes on a gatefold with all the band members double lp both come on printed inner sleeves Side A, side B, side C, and side D. And my vinyl pressing comes on this really cool looking green and I guess red swirl indigo color, I think, limited to 100 copies. And the final thing I have that's AMSG related is the four way split between AMSG, Savolder, Hostium, and the shittiest excuse for music ever done by Arrogance. <laughs> Why, 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 and why? Why is arrogance a part of this split? I don't fucking get it. Oh my god, man. Like, I remember when this was announced and put up for sale on Merchant of Death uh, back in 2017, and I was really stoked to get this. Because you have AMSG, Savolder, and Hostium, which are great black metal bands, and I had no idea who Arrogance were at the time, but I was just sold by the three bands that I knew of. And the concept for the split, though pretty stereotypical, I think works really well for black metal. I mean, you have Hostium, anti-Christian black metal. Savolder, which is kind of like Grand Belial's key worship anti-Islamic black metal. And AMSG, which is anti-Judaist black metal. You know, all three of them targeting, you know, the most 
popular and biggest religions in this world, so the concept makes total sense. Which doesn't make sense as to why is arrogance a part of this? Like, I just, I really don't understand. Like, I, I feel like this split, the only reason arrogance is put on this is because they, like, lost a bet or something, because I just, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Like, well, arrogance is such a terrible band. Like, they're so bad that, yeah, my me freaking out like this, it's justifiable because I cannot get over how terrible it is. Like, the, um, just, not the lyrics, just everything about it is just so bad. It is so bad that you should feel pathetic of a human being if you think, wow, arrogance actually sounds pretty good. You, you are scum. I hate you just because of that. Like, there is no justifying arrogance being positive in any way. To give you an example of just how terrible arrogance is, there is nothing I can find on YouTube or anywhere else of the material of this right here from the split, but there is other material still posted on YouTube, which I can show you. And seriously, guys, just try to absorb just this little bit of a taste of what arrogance sounds like. Oh my god, those are some of the worst vocals I've ever heard in my goddamn life. Like, he's literally just like, he's not even trying to do any type of, like, technique with his voice. He's literally just grunting in the safest way, going like, Ugh, wood smashing, stone crashing. <laughs> it's just so fucking bad, I just, I can't get over it. Like, there is a reason why I really name Arrogance as one of the worst musical projects I've ever heard within music itself. And the final thing I just want to say about Arrogance, because I really just want to roast this band to shit, is uh, the song titles are so incredibly terrible. Like, I know um, a few months ago, or like around the beginning of the year, I had a video about trying to read Cock and Ball Torture song titles without laughing. And I feel like I need to do another part to it, but read all these Arrogance uh, song titles, because they're they're almost, not almost, they're actually worse to some degree. Like, it just feels like the guy is like some 15-year-old that just got done chugging a bottle of Mountain Dew after getting off of playing, like, Call of Duty um, Modern Warfare 2 for seven hours straight and just started naming everything that came through his head when he got no-scoped by uh, some dude because these song titles, oh my god, are so incredibly edgy. It's just like, we, we gotta laugh at it. We got, uh, Bulldoze All Moss. <laughs> oh my god, it's like that 15-year-old atheist that feels like he's an in intellectual because he knows that there's no gods out there. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so fucking edgy. Then you have, uh, MMAs are homosexual deviants. <laughs> um, uh, what else we got? We got liberal shit scum. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Liberal shit scum? Like, oh my god. That's so immature. Oh my god. The, the next one. Unskilled immigrants benefit the economy. <laughs> my god. Come on, dude. Oh my god. Uh, social justice whore. <laughs> that literally sounds like a cock and ball torture song title. Um... What else? Bulldoze All Moss too. <laughs> he really couldn't think of anything else. He just did a sequel. <laughs> no moderate Muslims. <laughs> Paris is an Arab ghetto. <laughs> okay. Uh, what else we got? We got... And that's really it, actually. That's all I can find that are just, like, really, like, eyebrow raisin, just fucking pathetic edginess. Like... God, Arrogance, again, like I stated, is one of the worst musical projects in existence. Okay, with all that said, let's finally show the layout of this. It's a Darker Than Black and Merchant of Death uh, pressing, so it's going to be spot-glossed as shit like anything else. 
We got artwork right here, backside with the bands in question part of the split. Comes with an insert sheet for each band and just on standard black vinyl. For the rest of this video, it's all by one band and the crazy part is we're only gonna be cutting into like half of the stuff I have by them. So the next part, which will come next week, we have to do the other half along with other bands. So uh, yeah, let's get it started. First one up is the debut album by Anola Throck, The Codex Necro. For years, I've always said In the Constellation of the Black Widow is my personal favorite, which yes, still to this day, I absolutely adore that album to pieces. But honestly, more and more I listen to it, The Codex Necro is the superior Arnel Nathrock album. And not because, you know, this is like the only album within their discography that uh, Dave doesn't do any clean singing whatsoever. It's just the fact that this is just primitive extreme as it got back in the late 90s of industrial black grind that uh, really takes a lot of influence from bands like Thorns and Mysticum, but in my view really just, you know, propelled the genre to a whole new level of extreme. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a diehard and on the Throck fan, but I truly believe that when this album dropped in 1999, this was the most extreme it got within metal during its time. In my personal view, this is the most raw Dave's vocals ever were, and I really think it has the most aggressive uh, guitar work mix ever done for the band, so it just goes hand in hand, I feel like, as what will always be their most extreme album that really showcased that Anola Throck was a force to be reckoned with during their early days. And plus as well too, there's just some awesome tracks on here that are fan favorites that when I saw them live at the Maryland Death Fest, it was such a treat to hear them play some of the tracks. I mean, it's got um, <clears throat> the fan favorite, uh, When Humanity is Cancer, I mean that track's fucking awesome. Uh, Submissions for the Week, Pandemonic Hyperblast, and Human All Too Fucking Human, and of course uh, the title track's another great track as well. Just really from start to finish, this is just primitive black grind as you can get within the subgenre. As for the layout, this is a one and only time pressing put out through Fedo Records, and sadly, everything within their catalog has been repressed besides this one. And I remember getting this years ago when it didn't go for you know, stupid money as it does now. So I don't know why they haven't gotten around to doing a repress for this. Like, I guess they forgot it's within their catalog. But uh, yeah, really lucky I actually have this within the collection. So you have artwork right here, which if memory serves me right, the guy in the picture of this is a mixed brother. Backside with track listings, and right at the bottom right here, I don't know if the camera's gonna be able to pick that up, but it says, do not ask for lyric sheets as Anona Throck lyrics will never be published, which ironic enough, uh, their second to latest album, A New Kind of Horror, they actually released the lyrics themselves, which was quite shocking for, you know, fans like me with, of this band. The only other thing to show with this is the vinyl press. It comes, like, on this black vinyl with kind of like this brownish gold splatter in the middle, limited to 500 copies. Then I have their sophomore album, Domen Non S Dignus. This would be the album that they were to utilize for the first time, clean vocals, which would carry on all the way to present day with this band. And I would say this is their most industrial-fueled album within their catalog that still carries a bit of the rawness from the Codex Necro, but because of Dave utilizing his clean vocals, it's a bit smoothed out on the production to complement his vocals and the riffs as well played throughout this album. But tracks I really enjoyed a lot, actually my personal favorite within this album is uh, the track This Cannot Be The End that I think really showcases uh, Dave's singing to the best of his ability during the time. As for the layout and pressing, this is a Back On Black repress from 2014. As I stated earlier, Back On Black uh, represses are a bit uh, iffy. But when it comes to the Anona Throck back on black presses, they are all terrible. And like I stated, this is a repress from 2014 from back on black. And every now and then I try to convince myself to either get the first press, which was brought through Agonia, or the recent repress that I believe is from uh, Peaceville that probably sounds light years better than this. Like all the back on black 
reed presses for Anoma Thruck are just all muffled and they aren't as powerful as the CD uh, variants I have of the, or basically anything you'll find online. So I cannot stress it enough. If you want to get Anona Throck vinyl, do not get the back on black represses of any album. But anyway, enough of me rambling. Let's just keep the tradition going. We have the album artwork right here, backside with the track listings. Comes on a gatefold of each member, Mick and Dave. And this vinyl press comes on orange. From there, we go to the third album by Nona Throck. This is Eschaton. As you can see right here, I have two different variants of it. This is the back on black pressing, and this is the first press put out through Gardens of Exile. And just from the layout alone, you can tell that the contrast is a bit different as this has a darker shade to it. But uh, yeah, I'm basically preaching to the choir now, which I'll show the differences in a little bit. But yes, this is the third album by Anoma Throck, and this is where I really feel like their writing ship improved in terms of choruses, because this album is groovy and catchy as fuck. I mean, it's got the fan favorite between Shit and Piss We Are Born. That, that song can never get sickening. And I will say the uh, clean singing within this album definitely has like a power metal vibe to a certain degree on it, which really makes it all soaring and captivating, which has always sold me about Unknown the Thrack ever since I discovered them and just have been just addicted to them ever since. But yep, we have the fan favorite between Shit and Piss We Are Born. Um, Destroying Angel, I think, is one of their most explosive and heaviest songs they ever wrote. Uh, Waiting for the Barbarians has like one of the best riffs and grooves they ever did. And when the lion devours both dragon and child, I've listened to that song countless times because I just love how soaring and just mesmerizing uh, Day's vocals get when uh, he hits the chorus. It's uh, it just never gets sickening for me. As for the layouts of the two, they're a bit different. Like I stated, the album artwork, the contrast of the two is one is darker and one's lighter. But I'll show the uh, back on black variant first. So artwork, backside, this has a gatefold basically of the artwork just inverted. The back on black variant comes on crystal clear vinyl, which I find weird because the center labels look very odd with this pair up. As for the first press, the artwork, backside, this gatefold has very different looking artwork from the back on black pressing. And this variant comes on semi-translucent blood red vinyl, which I think looks a lot better. Then we go to the fourth album by Anona Throck, which is Hell is Empty and All the Devils Are Here. This album right here, I would say, easily has some of their most melodic and catchiest guitar riffs that they ever wrote. Uh, it actually has one of my all-time favorite uh, songs, too, by Anona Throck, which is Shatter the Emprium. That song, that riff, I, I don't care. The riff is going to get drilled into your head. And as well, too, I would say this has some of the most bombastic and chaotic just shrieks and snarls by Dave that it, he just sounds like an absolute madman on this album. That I would argue that a lot of people always try to decipher the lyrics by Nola Throg. And this is one of those albums where I truly believe there are no lyrics. Like, the dude is just literally shouting out nonsense just to make it sound all the more extreme, which, you know, is kind of a theory out there by some fans, which I do believe to a certain extent, because some of these shrieks, man, it's like, are you sure you're, you're actually making any words out of it? Because it just seems so inaudible to make out any type of syllable or anything. I don't know. But anyway, also as well, too, it has other great tracks, The Final Absolution, Until the World Stops Turning, Genetic Noose, which I would argue is one of the first ever songs to ever combine brutal death metal and black metal together, and it's absolutely badass sounding. As well, too, with Genetic Noose, uh, there is a guest vocal appearance from the vocalist of uh, A Circle of Dead Children. I don't know his name, but he puts on a stellar performance within that track. Just like the Codex Necro, this is a one and only time pressing put out through Fido. They've never done a repress, which is a damn shame because, again, I would argue as this is one of the top three best within the discography of Anomathrock, 
that really I would recommend this if you want to get into them. As for the layout, you have this artwork right here, backside with track listings, which I'm assuming with this artwork is just basically the aftermath of like a nuclear explosion. Comes on a gatefold, again with a passageway. I believe this is a uh, William Shakespeare passage uh, in the middle. And this vinyl pressing comes on red with black splatter. Of course, as well, I have the fan favorite by Nolan Throck. This is In the Constellation of the Black Widow. Once again, two different variants of this album, the uh, Back on Black and the First Press of it. First Press, once again, put up through Fido, and this is the Back on Black license by In the Constellation of the Black Widow. And again, it's something about the uh, Back on Black reissues. The album artwork, the contrast is just lighter compared to the First Press. Like, I don't understand why they do that. But again, this sounds terrible, the Back on Black pressing. I, I, I've talked about this album so much that I really don't want to go into detail with it. All I'll say is that this is easily the darkest Anon the Throck album, which is why I feel as if it's the fan favorite because of it. And, I mean, tracks on here I really enjoy are, of course, the title track in the Constellation of the Black Widow, More of Fire Than Blood, The Unbreakable Filth of the Soul, Terror in the Mind of God, and uh, Satan Christ, I think, has honestly one of the best riffs Mix ever done in general within his music career. So to show the difference between the two in layout, we'll start with the Back on Black pressing first. You have the artwork, backside, comes on a gatefold. The Back on Black pressing once again comes on a clear vinyl. As for the first press right here, I dig the artwork more just because of the contrast being darker. Backside with track listings. As well, also comes on a gatefold a little bit different from the back on black pressing. And this vinyl bearing comes on black. I don't know if it's going to show, but there's a little bit of like purple merge within the middle of the LP. As well, I have the follow-up to in the Constellation of Black Widow, which would be Anola Throck once again with their album. Passion. I would say that technically this is Anola Throck at their most experimental sounding. Some tracks on here are six and a half minutes long and there's another track on here that's like 90 seconds long. So it has their longest track and shortest track within this album. Then there's just some parts of it that they utilize kind of like some like noisy experimental moments. I know the uh, closing track on here, Portrait of the Artist, is kind of like this droney, dark ambient noise outro that uh, Maurice from Northern Tongues uh, helped out with it. As well too, there's a song, uh, Toad Hudet Yubel, probably saying that wrong, that has Rainer fucking Ladferman on a Nolma Throck track. Like, one of my favorite vocalists uh, partnering up with one of my favorite bands, like, God, it's like a, a fantasy basically come to life, that being a thing. And then there's a Paragon Pariah that has like more of a traditional Anonathrak track of, you know, it's three and a half minutes long. You have like the soaring, catchy chorus along with like the demented and crazy melodic riffs that uh, Mick does. Just um, overall, it's kind of like an oddball that I think works in them because it just makes their sound just so demented and crazy from start to finish. Once again, this is a back on black pressing that is decent, but I know recently uh, Candlelight did a repress for this, which I need to get because I can bet my life on it. The Candlelight uh, pressing that recently came out sounds better than this, I would say, compared to everything else I've complained about with all the back on black presses within the Anona Throck catalog. But um, yeah, um, other than that, just keeping the routine going. You have this really weird looking artwork, backside with the track listings, gatefold once again, and like every other back on black pressing I've showed thus far within the Anona Throck catalog, comes on a clear vinyl once again. As for the final record to show within this video, which isn't the last and on the track I own, but we're just gonna stop it here, that way this video doesn't drag out too long, because I still have another half a dozen and on the Throck albums to show you guys. But uh, next up is Benita's. Personally for me, I would say this is where the quality of an on the Throck kind of dips down a little bit. I mean, there's still great songs on here, like Forging Towards the Sunset, that song's absolutely kick-ass. And uh, probably the most underrated song, which is Make Glorious the Embrace of Saturn, which is just 
vintage Anon the Throck that I wish more people would dig that track because it's so good that no one ever talks about by them. But yeah, there's some songs on here that aren't really that memorable or good that just really feels like they're kind of toning down the extreme sound. Like To Spit in the Face and uh, what else is it? Feed in the Beast. It just feels like now they're being a really fast melodic death metal band more than you know the blackened industrial grind sound that they've been you know really stapling as their own for albums prior it just feels like they're becoming a bit more tamed on this album that just the quality of it kind of dips down a bit for me but uh, other than that it's just a really good melodic uh, take of the Anon the Throck sound I would say once again this is a back on black pressing as for the layout, we have the artwork, backside with track listings, as well as two comes on a gatefold, and this vinyl variant comes on gray. All right, guys, and that's it for this vinyl collection part. Like always, links provided to everything I've talked about will be in the description below, and we'll continue on with this series next week. Spoiler alert, yes, it's going to be even more Anon the Throck. It's just I didn't want to drag this video out over like, you know, 40 minutes plus because the last part was like over half an hour and I really don't want to make these videos that long. But uh, yeah, guys, other than that, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated. And most importantly of all, make sure you judge people by actually confronting them and getting to know them and not through a YouTube comment section.